Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for joining us today. This is Joe with the LSA, and I'd like to welcome all of you to our webinar series. Today's webinar is titled Bridging the Physical and Digital Worlds with Mobile, and will be brought to you by our guest presenter, Lara from Sonata. So with that, let's get started. Over to you, Lara. Thanks, Joe. So I'm really excited to be addressing all of you about a topic that gets me very excited today, and obviously part of uh, my decision to join Sonata and really build this business on a global scale. Um, what we're really going to talk about today is bridging that digital and physical world together. Uh, what we have found is that mobile is really kind of at the center and pivotal to everything that's happening um, in making that happen. We all talk about the last year was the year of mobile, this year is the year of mobile, five years ago was, next year. To me, that thought and that concept is almost irrelevant now because what we have seen is that mobile has actually provide us, provided us a progression of where the internet started and everything started moving to the internet in the early 90s with mass adoption to now these mobile devices coming up in the 2000s to today really taking it back to this element of commerce going online, commerce going to mobile, but there's still a lot of commerce happening in the physical world and how do we start bridging those gaps and start thinking about what the consumer journey really is and what that path to purchase is. So instead of thinking of you know, each device individually, we actually think of them together and we think of how we utilize mobile to help connect those dots. So what we really will be going into in this presentation is talking a lot about connecting those dots. So just getting a kind of you know, high level view the U.S. GDP is one of the largest in the world, and 70% of our economy is actually being driven by consumer spending. What we have seen is that the majority of spending is actually occurring within 15 to 20 miles of the home. I often caveat this because I live in New York City, and 15 to 20 miles seems really, really far to somebody who probably does most of my stuff within one to two miles and probably more online. However, when I think about leaving the city, most people get in their cars, they have these habits where they go to the grocery store on these days, they go to the pharmacy on these days, they go to the shopping mall on these days, and with pretty regularity, they've developed these habits um, where they are actually in store, and the online and mobile side is really contributing and influencing potentially what's happening then in store. So we're really trying to link those two things together, especially when we know that over 90% of retail is actually still happening in store. So with the growth of all the e-commerce and m-commerce that is happening and the continued investment that should occur there because it will only continue to grow, there's still such a large sector of commerce being driven in the physical store that, you know, we cannot actually ignore it any longer, that we need to continue to focus on driving foot traffic into the store, and mobile has given us a way to really start linking that gap. So mobile actually can influence 41% of store purchases where a desktop, it's only 16%, right? So when you're on your smartphone, you're on the go, um, sometimes you're actually doing activities there, you're reading your email, you're seeing sales come through, you're getting information that you're close to the location. Um, it might influence an online purchase, and it does almost 60% of the time, but it, with a higher rate than when you're sitting at home and you're a little bit more sedentary, it, will, it could influence actually driving to store and an in-store purchase. So these things are really, really important to kind of keep in mind as we start thinking about all the new technology that is out there and how that can all be applied to help businesses, both small, medium, and large, you know, kind of utilize that technology to bridge um, how they can influence it, more purchases. We also know that mobile users are spontaneous. Uh, one of the things that I will add here, because there's a lot of information coming out there now, that mobile shoppers are actually more male than they are female. 
and that comes down to more potentially the habitual behaviors of a woman shopping versus a male shopping. The males, they kind of are, you know, they don't want to go in the store. They don't want to waste time looking around. You know, they're not really browsers. They're in and out for a reason. And mobile really kind of contributes to what it is they're looking to do, whereas females tend to be a little bit more browsers. They may add purchase, add additional products to their purchase spontaneously and impulsively. Um, on the smartphone, because things are coming to their phones all the time, whether they're getting a notification or an email or they see an ad within a site or an app, they now have the ability to just say, I want this now. So much more spontaneous purchases are being driven on the phone. The ability to make those purchases quickly and easily, such as through Amazon or other programs, other payment methods, is making that even simpler and therefore driving those spontaneous purchases. Whereas on the PC laptop, it's still a large percentage, it's just a little bit less than what's on your phone. Your phone is with you all the time. You might not think when you're sitting at home that you needed to make that purchase of cereal, but when you're on your phone, you just left your house, you finished that box of cereal, and there's a reminder that you can buy that purchase of that box of cereal on your smartphone, so then you can click that button and literally make that purchase and potentially have it delivered that same day. Going a step further, mobile payments is another way that you know we will see a continued disruption in this entire space because of how it really influences that connection between online and offline. Originally, when mobile commerce came to be, everyone thought about, oh, you need to be able to make those purchases on your mobile phone. But what we are actually seeing now is that your phone now is your payment device. So you can go in stores and actually utilize your phone, which is connected to your credit cards or your banking accounts, and utilize that phone as if it were you pulling out your credit card out of a wallet. It's really interesting to, uh, to understand that Starbucks two years ago already drove $1 million in purchases that were transacted through the mobile device and the apps that they have where you integrate all your payment options. Today, obviously, that's a lot more, and this is where a lot of the investment has been going that people have been seeing through companies like Apple Pay, through what Google is now updating with their wallet, um, Square, all these other devices that are, all these other companies that are looking for ways to make that phone an easier purchase, which will help us then connect the dots between what we are trying to influence consumers and what they are actually doing. So the, the promise of mobile payments is humongous and people believe that by you know 2017 it'll reach about 1.5 trillion right so this is really where we're starting to, to bring those things together this leads us to really uniting the conversation that we have been having in the previous couple of slides where we talked about the offline commerce and the online commerce and the mobile commerce. And all of them have really been identified independently and usually are structured independently and thought of how do we attract and influence each of these channels. Instead of looking at them independently, we really think you have to look at them as one. They really, really work together because for a retailer, for a small business, for a franchise, at the end of the day, sales are sales. It almost doesn't matter where it's coming from, but if you understand how to influence consumers to drive those sales across any of these channels, it ultimately helps the bottom line and the ROI of what the business is trying to achieve. So we really think that you've got to bring those together, and mobile is the one that can really bridge that because when you're sitting sedentary at your PC, you don't really have a lot of the information to know if they actually went in store to make that purchase, but with your mobile phone, it's with you all the time. You're carrying it with you um, from one location to the other. We can start to then bridge those gaps, and we'll go into that a little bit in more detail down the, the road with how we can do some of that measurement. But for right now, it's really, really important to understand how that movement can be monitored and understood with a mobile device. We also see that mobile ad engagement increases when you're closer to the store. So when you think about when you're on the go, it's 
we can do the right thing by serving an ad and serving information up to a potential consumer that is really, really, really relevant, plus really, really hyper-focal targeted to the location so that you're in that vicinity, the likelihood of that driving a store visit is so, so, so much higher. So really under two miles really can drive a lot more engagement with that mobile ad, which can lead to potential store visits than when they are further away. So to sum all this up, it really drives us to that consumer path to purchase, which is being driven by mobile. Mobile is really that, you know, that conduit kind of at the center of how to bring these pieces together, the advances in the technology as well as that proliferation of the smartphones is driving this opportunity. Even though smartphone penetration in the U.S., I hear different numbers between 45 and 55 percent, we, we know it's only growing. We know on a global scale it's growing. You know, a lot of people are picking up whether it's iPhone or Android devices, and this is opening up the opportunity for us to really understand how to drive messaging with reach, really get in front of the majority of the consumers, how to really think about the motivational factors of the phone. And, and this is really, really important when you think about how you, you want to engage with consumers to get them to really react to what is being shown. And you know, knowing that they might be looking for information, knowing that they might be looking to be entertained, knowing that they might be interested in transacting, all those can influence how you might want to present um, in front of a potential customer in order for them to engage. So the engagement is really, really important. That will then drive them to convert. Um, and there's a lot of, you know, research and evaluations that are being done as to how mobile is used in that path to purchase in order to really drive that conversion irrelevant to if it's on the mobile device versus if it's on a desktop device or if it's in store. Right? And those are the three elements that really kind of bring together the opportunity of why mobile has now become so, so, so important. Um, you know, Mary Meeker came out yesterday with her, you know, state of the, the internet um, industry study, and it's still really alarming to know that the usage of mobile devices has grown and is now equal to that of the internet. However, the advertising budgets that are allocated to mobile is still a very, very significant delta to what the actual usage is and the time spent on those devices, where on the internet it's a little bit more equal now. So we still, as businesses and as advertisers, aren't really fully understanding how important and how integral mobile is to the space. And instead of looking at mobile as just a, another device, I think it's actually more important to start thinking about it as the device that can now bridge that gap. And hopefully with more of the investment in technology and linking those together, we'll be able to see a little bit more of a closing of that gap for, again, usage and dollars spent and invested in mobile. So it leads me to where you are is who you are, which is core to what we at Sonata believe. Um, and it's really identifying a person or a group of people and a profile based on your location. But you, as a person, move a lot. So your profile changes. So the location patterns that are built um, really can build better audience intelligence if they're used correctly. And this can then influence those in-store traffic and in-store sales that businesses are looking to achieve. So we're going to go into this concept a little deeper. Mobile plus location, those two elements together, can really build those audience profiles and base it on two things that we've talked about. Well, one thing we talked about, which is your habitual behaviors, knowing, you know, you go to the grocery store on these days, you go to the pharmacy on these days, et cetera, but also the surroundings of the target audience. We break this down into two elements. There's the geo-profile side of it, and then there's the geo-contextual side of it. The profiling side is exactly what we've talked about up to this point in this uh, presentation, which is you know, where you are, what's the profile of you here, where were you before, where might you go in the future based on what we know about you. So this is really your real-life activity and knowing more about your habits. 
um, the contextual side is where this can get really, really interesting. This is now saying what's happening around you. So if I say to you that your profile is, you know, you live in New York City, you eat out three times a week, you don't have a car, and you go out of the city on the weekends, you know, that is your one profile. But if I also know that you're a business traveler living in New York City, when you're in L.A. two days every week, you're actually a different profile over there than you are when you're in New York. What I mean by that as an example, so maybe I'm in auto and tender. Right? I live in New York City, I'm looking to buy a car. When I'm in New York City, having opportunities about learning about cars that are coming out, getting more information, and potentially driving me to a dealership is actually really, really relevant. But when I'm in LA, I might still be interested if I'm at that point in the cycle of research about learning about cars. But if I'm really on that path of purchase and I'm ready to do all those test drives, Throwing in front of me an ad that suggests, oh, go visit this dealership in L.A. is completely irrelevant because I'm not buying a car in L.A. and it makes no difference to me if you show that ad. So it's kind of a wasted impression. But when I'm in L.A., knowing that I'm there on business, I might want to be made aware of a new hotel that's opening up where I always go or restaurants that are in the area. Um, so these are things that are really, really important into the profiling side. Now, when I add the contextualization to it, these are things that are happening around me. It could be weather. It could be traffic. It could be pollen count, UV index, anything that's really important to what's happening. It could be that I'm in New York, but I'm at the beach versus being in the city, right, in Manhattan. And those things can then influence what I might do. On a rainy day, you don't really want to show an ad that's sending somebody to an outdoor cafe, but you might want to show an ad that sends someone to a movie theater because people tend to go see movies when it's raining. Um, we have a case example a little bit later that talks about identifying correctly the temperature that people, the temperature that really takes people over the hump and get them to buy more ice cream in the summertime. You know, what is that? That's really important to people who are trying to sell ice cream. You know, we're working with a, you know, a consumer now that's looking to sell sunscreen. Well, sunny days are more important than rainy days because sunny days people are outside and they're going to use sunscreen more. So all this is really, really important added to that profile. And now we build a much richer set of information that helps all kinds of businesses, right? You know, small businesses to me are even more starved for how this information is important to them. It all sounds so, you know, high level, it sounds so complex, it sounds so technolog technologically advanced, yet when you break it down, it is really important to, uh, for small businesses to understand how this affects them, right? People um, that went to a salon one day, once we know that they've been there, maybe they want to go again. But to know if people get their hair cut more so on a rainy day versus a sunny day versus a windy day may or may not have an influence. But it's really, really important to understand, and this can actually help bring real-life activity and real-life results to businesses that don't really understand how mobile can actually influence that, and that's connecting those dots. There are a lot of targeting and measurement opportunities in mobile. The majority of these are actually pretty standard for anyone that has really gone into mobile and, and looked at what the opportunities are, you know, device, platform, operator, et cetera. However, there's some things that are really interesting that fall in line with what we were just talking about. The vertical themes, the geo profiles and audience target, and the contextual layers really can do an additional layer of influence, and those have become much, much, much more important where location is about where you are at that moment, but it's more about who you are. Um, and bringing that to life, I think, is really, really important in any kind of advertising program that is really thinking about driving foot traffic and influencing the business. Um, retargeting is now important. So we say in mobile um, that because, you know, as anybody who may or may not be doing it on the display side, retargeting is usually based off of what's called a cookie. You know, this little piece of code that sits on your computer usually for about 30 days um, so that you know where a person has been and you can retarget them with the right information. In mobile, we don't really have the same technology at the same scale, but we have what we call location. And location can actually be a better form of retargeting than 
potentially a cookie because now we know where you've been. When we know where you've been somewhere and we know that you drove you somewhere, we can retarget you to go back there. So going back to that example of a salon, if we sent um, an ad that persuaded you to go try a salon, I really want to build customer loyalty. I don't want to just focus on a one-time visit. Maybe I see you're in that same area within 30 days. I might send you a reminder through an ad when it's not disruptive to the consumer to say, hey, you know, salons in the area, don't you need another haircut? Or, you know, here's $10 off to come back now and, and visit us. Um, or make an appointment now and just drive a real action. And this can then build that awareness, but it makes it really relevant to them when they're in that location or where they're in the right time of potentially making another purchase or having another haircut. And then the last layer on the target, and that's really important, is more the measurement, actually, which is your in-store attribution. And we're going to go into that in detail here in a second. Mobile strengthens that consumer connection. This continuum is what sits behind the ability to really be successful for brands utilizing what we know from mobile and really thinking about how we take that and drive that in-source foot traffic or sales, right? So we build that location data-driven audience, which we've talked about. Then we use that to deliver those relevant messages. But where we get really important, where we get really um, lost sometimes, I think, is that creative real-time engagement. Because if you go back to the old Mad Men of advertising, it was all about making somebody feel really emotionally connected to a brand. And that was done through the advertising story that was developed, whether it was shown in print or on TV. Where we've come now is we want to build scale, which is great. We want to be really, really efficient. But a lot of our ad units are very structured, very small. Um, and are not necessarily always thinking about building those experiences. What we want to do with mobile is bring some of that back to life because the device is so personal to the consumer, it actually now can bring back this you know, emotional side and really engagement with those creatives that we are driving on behalf of advertisers, which then can do the influencing of driving the foot traffic and sales and repeat visits and boosting that loyalty. Underneath all of this is really sitting that real-time analytics, that attribution, as much information that we can garner in order to say, have we been successful in what we've done or not, and why and how. Um, and that is what's bridging those gaps between the online and the offline metrics to really understand how those devices, all those different devices that consumers are using, influences them to make a purchase. So let's go a little bit into the attribution side and how we connect those dots. We see this, I've grouped this up kind of in four basic ways. Um, the first is just location-based technology. So it should be at this point pretty obvious to understand that if we know where you are at a certain type, time and we can drive an ad to you, well, we probably are seeing you many times as you are going through the streets or, you know, as you are... Um, going along your way, right? So as we see you many times, we actually can then identify if we are getting you closer to your destination or in your destination. And we can do that with, you know, a certain percent of accuracy within a relatively small radius. So let's say about 60 meters, right? You know, we know pretty well. In New York City, you know, buildings on top of buildings, businesses on top of businesses, the level of accuracy is probably a little less than if you are somewhere, let's say, in the Midwest where there's so much space and each business has its own building. So we utilize that technology. It helps us identify, you know, where we first saw you, where we continue to see you with those ads, and if we were successful in influencing you based on the ads that we showed. The second area is what I call couponing. But couponing to me is can be sometimes negative um, because people and businesses are kind of tired of discounting. I mean, I, I don't know about you, but, you know, there are quite a few stores that email me all the time, and I will refuse to make any purchase unless I get that 40% coupon because I know if it's not there one day, it will be there within three days. So discounting has kind of developed its own negative connotation, but sometimes couponing can be very, very effective if it's done correctly at the right time and knowing when a consumer really needs an extra 
push to drive them into store to make a purchase. But it's also a way for us to track if a person who saw an ad and we influence them correctly actually activated upon it. The other way with the couponing is I say loyalty building. The measurement on the loyalty building sometimes is a little bit less clear, but one of the things that we um, can do is a passbook integration where people store not just coupons, but they store loyalty programs, which can be triggered as reminders in very specific lat launch locations. So it's a very subtle way of doing a push notification, which um, is not something we've really spent a lot of time on in, in this conversation yet, but it's a way to kind of get them get, get in front of them and then idle screen where it isn't too intrusive. So both of those ways um, really help also drive a little bit more measurement to connecting those dots. The next is the beacon technology. There's a lot of talk about these beacons and the promise of what these beacons can do is really unbelievable, right? Now we actually, with much greater accuracy, can identify what's happening in stores. What are the patterns that people take? Are ads actually influencing getting people into the store and getting them in front of the aisle of the ad that was shown? Um, it really brings a whole new level of data into advertising to really make it more effective. Bringing in the push notifications, where a lot of companies have really focused is more on the push notification side of the business, which is once you are in the store, now all of a sudden I can message you and let you know, like, sales are going on here, or here's a discount for this, or here's a discount for that. I firmly believe that we need to be a little bit more on the conservative side when it comes to the push notification, because the more push notifications that are in front of consumers, the more annoyed they will be, and then they will turn it off altogether. There's also the question as to who owns, you know, that push notification when a person is in the store. Is it the, the brand that drove them into the store or is it that store? I think we need to, you know, I think the whole industry needs to be a little bit more careful, but what we can do is we can utilize that data and really make it more of a pull of advertising. So when people are on their, in their apps, or on sites, which they often are all the time. Nobody can sit still anymore. You're always doing something on your phone. You now can drive really, really relevant messages based on the fact that we know we got you in the store because of that beacon technology. And then lastly, what everybody wants to do is integrate it with actual point of sale. Point of sale systems are highly, highly complex. If you look at some of the major retailers, you know, opening those up and getting that information out, it, you know, eventually we believe it will happen, but it's not going to happen as quickly as maybe some of the smaller retailers, franchises, or small businesses that have, you know, less complex point of sale systems that can actually link that data right back into the advertising side, whether it happens in real time or with a short delay, to really bring um, all this data back into developing that return on ad spend. So there are a lot of different ways that we can utilize this. One way that I didn't really mention was a surveying way. So we could also do brand studies that give us a look back window to suggest, you know, we, they saw an ad and within 30 days we know that we drove them back into the store. So from, you know, we, we kind of do that with our location-based technology. My point here is really that not any one of these alone is necessarily the right solution, but all of them together, then per, and as many of these that we can activate, really start to provide that rich data back to understanding how what happens in mobile really drives what happens in the offline world and helps us to bridge those gaps. So there's going to be a lot more investment in how all of these things work together in the coming months and years because it's really what's now driving a lot of how do I influence and get more incremental sales, whether it be online, offline, on mobile. So let's go through a couple examples. Um, I always think it's really nice to, to kind of see how this works in the real world. This first example is about an apartment building that wanted to drive people interested in living near a football stadium. So their thought was, well, you know, people who want to live near a football stadium, an NFL football stadium, probably are football enthusiasts, sports enthusiasts, maybe New Orleans Saints fans. So what we did in this case was really geofence the stadium during games and the surrounding areas to say, hey, 
come check out this new apartment building that's right here. And if you live here, it's really easy to go see any of the games that are right next door. So it was utilized as a way to identify based on a location that there were these audience profiles that would meet the needs of somebody that might want to live in this apartment building that was set up very close to the stadium. This next case study was about driving to a dealership. Um, dealerships are really interesting because they're usually one person owns a dealership or a couple of dealerships, but they're very, they're set up very specifically around radiuses, usually around zip codes, but sometimes even more incremental. So we had to be very, very particular about only looking at this specific location. It was in Danbury, Connecticut, and where they have the right to advertise because we couldn't actually go into the other areas, which then actually needed to be sent to another Mercedes dealership. So we were able to really get them to engage with this ad largely because of the map that was built in. So we could target luxury consumers. We could look, identify auto intenders. We continue to build the custom audience profiles based on the information that was coming into us with the ad that we were showing. And we were able to really drive that engagement rate up because we made it really relevant to people who actually wanted to go into a dealership. This is an example of bringing contextual information in to really drive additional sales for an ice cream. This was where we identified what was that temperature that really took people from maybe buying an ice cream to absolutely getting an ice cream or being interested in ice cream. And we found for them that the temperature was 86 degrees. What was interesting about this, obviously we also found there was a higher engagement in August and June and July. August is a little bit more, considered a little bit more that vacation month. But what we were able to also show the client was that the, the opportunity of people to buy ice cream on the coast was actually much higher than it was in the city. And it didn't mean that people weren't buying in the city, but it allowed us to allocate the spend and really drive incremental ice cream sales where people were much, much, much more likely to buy them. I always laugh and I say, you know, when you're on the beach, you might eat five ice creams a day, whereas when you're in the city, maybe you'll only eat one, right? So when, when you're in that different mindset and really understanding that with a mobile device, it could influence the way that an advertiser would spend their money and then drive a lot of incremental sales in ice cream without having to invest as much on the advertising side. So it created additional efficiencies and higher return on ad spend. This is an example of how we can use social messaging integration to really drive a lot more purpose to an advertisement. So it was about selling, sending a, a, a free popcorn when you go to this movie theater. It was a local movie theater. This one was done in the Madrid area, and you integrated it with WhatsApp. You know, we could have done it with Facebook and with Twitter, and we've done a lot of work with a lot of the other um, sharing applications, even for Instagram. However, those is kind of like a mass share where it might be people that you know, but know I use in loose terms. It could be an acquaintance um, or it could be a really close friend. Through actual direct messaging where we linked it directly into the messenger, you sent it to a very small group of friends and sent it out, we were able to engage them at a lot higher rate to actually go into the movie, go see a movie, and then they were given a free popcorn. So that small, tight-knit community could have more influence than sharing to a larger community because people seem to trust you more and they seem to act on what it is you are sharing with them. You're that trusted source for them. So utilizing, again, the motivation of what people are doing on their device and understanding how they are using it at that moment really can be very, very effective in driving the right actions to the right businesses in the offline world. This is just an example of that passbook integration where you could create some type of a loyalty or a code or a coupon that you could save to Passbook and then you would be prompted when you are in very specific locations in your idle screen as a reminder, hey, you've got this coupon or hey, you know, there's, you know, Sephora is a great one because they're always showing up when I'm close to a Sephora. Hey, did you know if Sephora was in your area? And I know that that's set up through my Passbook integration with them. 
So then, you know, we say it's a push notification, but it's really um, more of this passbook notification. So all in all, you know, there are many different ways and many different opportunities to utilize the phone to really engage the consumer. But what we believe businesses really need to focus on is understanding, you know, what their motivation is, where they are in the purchase cycle, what's happening around them, what is their profile, and then really driving them to to a place where we can measure and attribute what an advertisement is doing in terms of influencing that purchase, regardless of it occurs on a desktop, on a mobile phone, or in the physical world. And the promise of how all these things are starting to connect are actually becoming a reality today, and it makes it for a very, very exciting marketplace and a lot of opportunity for businesses of all sizes. Thanks, Laura, for conducting today's webinar, and thanks to everyone for attending today. If you have any questions or would like to be connected with today's speaker, simply email us at webinars at the LSA.org. Also, for a look at what's coming and to access all of our past webinars, visit www.thelsa.org webinars. So thanks again, everyone, and have a great day.